So let's start. Uh, uh, just a short look on the contents for today. Uh, last time we looked at these locations in a linear elastic homogeneous medium, which is the basis for any dislocation investigation, for any calculation with these locations. And today we switch gears and go now into this location structure in crystals. We will see the Bias Navarro model, which is historically the first model which has gone beyond linear elasticity. I will show you the derivation and expressions for the core energy, the core width, and the bio potential. Then um, I'm going to um, describe a little bit interatomic bonding and methods to treat interatomic bonding, which is the modern way of doing these location simulations. The Bias Navarro model is still used in specific uh, occasions to treat um, these locations, but not as much anymore. Maybe 95% uh, of the dislocation investigations are being done nowadays with interatomic potentials using semi empirical methods mostly, but also density functional theory. Both of them are in use. This is the program for today. Next lecture, then I'm going to talk about specific crystals, SCC crystals and BCC crystals, because they have their own specific dislocation structure on the atomic scale. Yes, but for today, we will stick to the Pius Navarro model and also a short overview how one can treat bonding in general, which is the basis then to discover also dislocations in other crystals. We'll go and jump to where we are. I would just like to shortly review the student presentations as they are at the moment. Um, we have here eight topics at the moment, yes. And um, I think this is quite nice. I think every topic is very good. Uh, I'm looking forward to hear more about these topics also. Maybe the only overlap I can see maybe between Tobias uh, topic and also the one of David Haselsteiner. But I think you know um, that the other one is also having such a topic. So maybe you can also very shortly just communicate. I think Tobias, you're going to talk more yes. about the initial way of calculating. Yes, of course. I'm coming from the theoretical side and mm -hmm. I think measuring elastic constants, uh, this is a practical thing. And then our topics uh, actually uh, don't have anything to do with each other. Yeah, okay. So because uh, measuring elastic constants could also go into thermal dependent elastic constants in principle. <laughs> yeah, but from so, the practical side, and yeah, that's but where I also we, don't yeah. know a lot. <laughs> maybe we can add here a initial description of thermal dependent okay, yeah. elastic constants. Mm -hmm. So it's also in terms of the topic um, mm -hmm. better separated. We Anyways, but this is just a, a small remark. We have very advanced topics like uh, these location avalanches, for example, um, or also dynamic recrystallization, hot torsion testing. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hear about these topics. Please keep it uh, always on a level that um, can be understood by people who don't know about recrystallization in general, so everyone can follow your presentation. Okay, well, let's go now to the next topic, dislocation structure in crystals. What is the task or what is the problem? We have seen last time that in the center of the dislocation, we have a singularity where stresses, strains, and also energy um, becomes infinite. And that is a problem uh, because that's not the real situation. If you look in a um, dislocation core, here shown for a very simple cubic crystal, this is just a schematic kind of image, but it could also be real if we were to describe uh, edge dislocations in a cubic crystal, it would look like this more or less. Um, then we see in the center of the dislocation that we have very strong distortions. So if you look at the shear distortion, for example, of this original segment here, it is considerable, right? And if we go even in the center, you can see that the shear distortion 
is way beyond what one considers usually in linear elasticity. And so in the core, more specifically in this marked region, let me point, in this marked region, we need something else than linear elasticity. And um, we already have uh, talked about the gamma surface, uh, which is a nonlinear materials law, which tells us how the energy changes when we shift a layer with respect to the other one. If we shear it, and also go far beyond the linear regime. So the first lecture, I have explained that a little bit uh, in more detail. Um, the law, the energy versus um, displacement law is sinusoidal as shown here. And that is a nonlinear law because the linear in linear elasticity, the energy would always change in quadratic fashion. So it would be a parabola here uh, going into the minimum. And we see here that uh, at this type of shear distortion, we are actually here. So that means that we are far away from a quadratic law directly in the core of the dislocation. And that changes things. That makes, that removes, first of all, the singularity because energies do not go to infinity. And also stresses and strains do not go to infinity. But that requires also a new derivation for stress, strain, and energy. And I will show you uh, the essential elements of that derivation. I do not go into all the mathematical uh, details. There are some steps which I leave out because I think they are just uh, a mechanic. So one just has to go through the math. Um, but the main aspects of the derivation will be presented now. I follow here a paper that has been published by Gunther Schöck uh, some years ago, 2005. Gunther Schöck uh, was a highly distinguished researcher in the field of theory of dislocations. He worked in many countries, Germany, uh, the States, Argentina and Austria, and I got to know him in the last years of his activity, while he was still in Austria, um, I yeah, started to interact with him because I was simulating these locations. And so he brought me closer to the Bias Navarro model and I learned to appreciate it. Uh, so I will follow his presentation, his um, way of looking at the Bias Navarro model uh, as he has shown in this paper. Just a warning, if you uh, read the Pius Navarro model or if you look it up in the Hirth and Lothe, um, it's described also there, uh, but it's uh, quite complicated there, more than needed. Also, Gunther Schöck had this impression. And um, if you look it up in the, um, in the other book, Harlem Bacon, it's a little bit too simple. I think this paper is very well written and written by somebody who really spent 20 years of his research career working with the Pius Navarro model. Okay, so I will show you the most important elements of the derivation. Very important to the general concept of the Pius Navarro model is that we separate uh, our material into two regions. One is the nonlinear region, where we have a nonlinear materials law, as shown before. This is everything which uh, happens between the two layers where the dislocation is formed and where we make the cut. And all the rest of the material has no crystal structure anymore. You can consider it as being just a homogeneous linear elastic medium. That is intrinsic to the Pius Navarro model that one distinguishes and divides the whole uh, material into these two regimes. And then one does something very simple. One cuts the medium into two parts along this line here and starts to displace the boundaries relative to each other with a function u of x that is still unknown at the moment. You just assume that the function will run more or less like shown here. So we um, the displacement of the atoms in the lower layer uh, with respect to the atoms in the uh, top layer, they follow more or less such a progression. So this is how u of x looks like. 
but we don't know exactly how u of x looks exactly. The mathematical expression is not known, but one can imagine that one does uh, what's shown here. And then you have a shear stress, which results from the linear elastic medium by pressing here and um, pulling on, on the top uh, part. And you have also a shear stress, which results from the nonlinear regime, which is the bonding of atoms. And you require that the stresses are the same. And uh, with, it, with that condition, you derive the exact function of u of x. That is basically the way how the Pius Navarro model was derived. Uh, so I want to go a little bit now more into the <clears throat> uh, details how the stress is obtained, because we are going to equate two stresses, the nonlinear and the uh, linear elastic stress. Let's first look into the nonlinear regime. So we have the atoms from both sides. And now we assume we have the gamma surface, but the gamma surface is valid only if I shear the whole layer on top of each other, right? We have seen that in the first part of the lecture. So if I rigidly displace the whole layer with respect to the layer on the bottom, I get a sinusoidal variation of the energy. Now the clue is that when I form a dislocation, in here I see all parts of this gamma surface as shown here. If I go very far to the left, I will be more or less in the minimum because there I have an unfaulted crystal. As I go into the dislocation core, the center is here, I move up locally um, the gamma surface and as I go more towards the right, I will end up in the end again here because I have again an unfaulted crystal. That is uh, how the misfit energy in the dislocation core or in the layer where the cut is made is calculated. You can see how the energy looks like locally and also how the stress looks like locally. Um, if we just evaluate, um, if you start from the gamma surface that we have seen before, u of x is a function which runs more or less like shown here. It goes from zero to b, which is the Burgess vector. Now I can insert u of x into our expression for the gamma surface. I just replace what we had here, um, u, now with u of x. It's a function that I don't know at the moment. But more or less, it will look like this, that it's zero far away where there is no distortion. It will be maximal in the center of the dislocation where I have the highest um, misfit. And it will decay again when I go to the right. The stress, which is, which is the derivative of gamma with respect to x, then uh, looks more like, like shown here. It increases, is maximal here. Here, where the derivative is zero, it's zero, and then changes sign because the shear stress changes sign as I move from the left to the right. Professor? Yes? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, why in UX function add uh, uh, X of equal to uh, infinite or whatever, mm -hmm. the value of, of UX is B? Yes, because why is I, higher? Say again. Why the value of ux yeah. at the end is higher than the value of EU, ux at the beginning? If yes, the because, energy is mm -hmm. equal. Yes, that's a good point, right? So if you look here, I show you here. I have a very small distortion, right? This is my starting point. Here, the crystal is on top of each other, is undistorted, right? Now I pull and I start displacing the two atoms with respect to each other. So I get U of X is increasing more and more. And then here you see now this atom lands on top of the next atom. It has displaced exactly by one nearest neighbor distance because this atom now, which in an unfolded situation would be on top of this atom here, 
is now due to the insertion shifted by one full nearest neighbor distance. And that is exactly then the Burgess vector in the simple cubic crystal structure. Does okay. that answer? Does yes. that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Always ask questions. It's important so you really can get the most out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, the, the point, right? So that with the U of X the displacement, U of X is the the relative shift of this atom of the top atoms with respect to the lower atoms, right? Okay. And uh, yeah, that gives me. And then I can see since this one now I have displaced a lot, right? I have displaced by B. So you could think, okay, but the energy then is highest. But since I'm here, then going back to my to a situation where I'm very close to an undistorted crystal, the energy drops down because the gamma surface is maximal and then goes down back to zero. And here you see the, um, uh, yeah, the effect of the non-linear model that it goes up and down and is not quadratic, right? So I don't need to have any a cylinder that I cut out and a inner cutoff radius and so forth. So because this this situation here looks so similar to here, it's also kind of mm, clear that the energy, the local energy goes down to zero again. Okay, so this is the stress as it comes out from the nonlinear model in the interface. Now we need also the stress generated by my gray homogeneous material. And there is another thing that I want to uh, explain a little bit more in detail. That is uh, the dislocation density. Uh, in general, the dislocation density is given by the derivative of u of x by x. <clears throat> now, if I have a very sharp dislocation, uh, like we have seen, let's uh, consider a linear elastic uh, description like we have uh, discussed last week. And you imagine you have a very, very small inner cutoff radius, right? Now, if you were to plot u of x, it would jump very sharply from zero to b exactly as I go by the dislocation. And if I take the derivative, I get a, a very sharp spike, which tells me here I have the dislocation in the center, right? And it's one and it's very sharp and it's uh, uh, located exactly at one spot. Now I can imagine that I partition my dislocations into many small ones and I make a smeared out distribution. So now every little dislocation has a Burgess vector, which is much smaller than the Burgess vector of the, of the sharp dislocation. But the sum of all the Burgess vectors of these small dislocations sums up to the same value here, because I get now u of x here will reach the same level, will reach again b. But what I have as a difference now is that I have a certain width of the dislocation or a width that results from the smeared out distribution of a dislocation. Uh, and it was pious to introduce this concept also in order to be able to uh, solve the pious Navarro model. And if I look now, we have gone through the derivation of the shear stress for a sharp dislocation in linear elasticity. It looks like this. Uh, <clears throat> so it's G divided by two pi one minus the Poisson ratio uh, divided by X here, um, which gives me the singularity in the core. And now I can imagine I have this smeared out distribution where I do nothing else than adding all the contributions up since we are in linear elasticity we can always add displacement and stresses linearly. And that is happening with the integral here. So what I do if I'm interested in a specific spot, let's say X, right? And I want to know the stress at this spot here, what I have to do is to integrate over all, or in this case of this image, I would sum up all the small dislocations. If I think about it in a continuous way, what I'm doing is then I'm integrating, right? And I integrate over all these locations, which give me a contribution um, in the spot X. And since the law is one divided by X, it is now one divided by X prime minus X, multiplied by the density, which tells me how many dislocations I have in a certain interval dx. 
prime. Otherwise, the expression is identical, right? It's just that one smears out the dislocation. And now we are there where we should be. We have now an expression for the misfit uh, <coughs> part, which was this one here. This gives me the stress arising from the bonding in the interface. And I have the stress which comes from the linear elastic medium, which is expressed as a series of um, uh, dislocations. So by this integral over all these locations, this is a trick really, because one could also think uh, about uh, using linear elasticity, displacing by u of x uh, above and down, and then say, okay, and now I want to know what the stress is here. And it was, uh, yeah, the, the, a part of this derivation to recognize that one can also just simply imagine to have a lot uh, of small dislocations which are smeared out, which creates then in the end, the stress field that will be the same as I had uh, the linear elastic situation where I have displaced by U of X, right? So to make this, maybe I just go back here just uh, shortly again. So in order to, to know how the medium, what kind of stress it creates, one just uses here the fact that U of X and the dislocation density is related in this way and then can derive this expression here. But the important thing is now I have two stress expressions which should be the same, one related to the misfit and the other one related to the linear elasticity. And this has to be solved now to get U of X. And if we have U of X, then we have solved the problem. This is an integral differential equation and Piles was the first to find a solution for it. It's not so easy to solve it, but he found that the Arcus-Tangens function solved this equation. And so we have again Arcus-Tangens function. We already had it in linear elasticity and now we are back to the Arcus-Tangens function, which also solves the nonlinear problem. That's quite interesting, but um, it, it is like this. It's not exactly the same though, the function. Uh, it looks a little bit different, but I will show it on the next slide. But for the moment, it's only important to recognize that if you inserted this expression now into this equation, you would solve this equation. So you would insert here the Arcus-Tangens, also here, and you would find that the two parts of the, um, of the equation are the same, so the stress is the same, and that solves then our um, problem. Important is also to realize that now we have in the arcus tangens a new quantity, which is called the width. Um, this tells us how broad the dislocation is. And the width is uh, in this simple approach of a sinusoidal gamma surface is given by A, which is the period, uh, in our case, also the Burgess vector, and divided by two, one minus the Poisson ratio. If we have not a single cubic lattice, it would get a little bit more complicated. Uh, then A and the Burgess vector would be different. In the, in the simple cubic lattice, it's the same quantity because the distance between two, um, between two atoms here is the same as the Burgess vector. Okay, so this was the expression for U of X, which solves essentially our problem. Uh, we can now ask, okay, what is the dislocation energy? It has also changed. For the dislocation energy, we have to again make a summation over the two parts, the nonlinear part, which is the misfit part, it's called M here, and then the linear elastic part, which is called here EL, like linear elastic. And e, uh, I will not go through the derivation here. It's not easy to see clearly why the integral over gamma of x dx equates to gb squared l divided by four pi one minus the Poisson ratio. Um, but I want to spare you now uh, a lot of mathematical details. Important is to realize that the function that we have discussed before, which is this gamma of x, if I integrate it from minus to plus infinity, what I get in the end is an expression which is shown here, is just the shear modulus times b squared times the length of the dislocation divided by 4 pi 1 minus the Poisson ratio. For the linear elastic energy, 
it is the expression is obtained similar to what we have seen last week for the gauss rogatsky theorem. So you use the same concept that you multiply the stress with uh, the displacement and then you integrate over uh, the x. You do that for basically minus, again, for minus infinity to plus infinity. In this case, it's good to have a bound. So r has to go towards infinity, but it's, co it's good to conf consider here a bound because it will turn out that the integral then the result is logarithm of capital R divided by two uh, twice the width. So you see again that the energy, like we had already already for the linear elastic case, also now for the Bryce Navarro model, diverges if R gets infinite. So also with the Bryce Navarro model, if I have an infinitely large system and I insert one dislocation the energy that I have to invest to do that is infinite. <laughs> so that's different if I, for example, create um, a point defect, where I, if I insert a, a point defect, I can imagine that this will be a localized um, distortion, and this will give me uh, always a finite energy, no matter whether I'm, uh, uh, whether I have, I don't know, uh, a very large system or an even larger system, right? In the case of these locations, this is not true. As I increase the outer cutoff radius, the outer radius, my energy goes up, keeps going up, and is uh, goes to infinity. I already mentioned that that is something to consider then always in derivations, uh, where one works with this location energy and line tension. Um, but I will say I will explain that maybe in the next uh, lectures when it's more appropriate. What is important that we have now here, uh, we don't have the core radius, but we have a width, which is a fine, which has a finite value. And so we don't have this um, inner cutoff radius anymore. And we don't have the divergence in the center of the, um, of the dislocation core. So in the end, the energy now is obtained by summing the two parts together. And if I sum them together, what I get is this expression here. So essentially one adds the logarithm plus one and gets this expression here. And that gives me now the energy of the dislocation in the bias navarro model. I can go and compare now to what we got from linear elasticity. And uh, we can see here um, that in linear elasticity, the stress, for example, was given by this expression here. Uh, it diverges at in the origin where yeah, x is zero. In the Piers Navarro model, now I have a different expression. It's very similar, but it is now here. The one over x is now replaced by x divided by x squared plus the width squared. And so we can see if x is zero, the stress has a finite value and is not infinite. Same for the energy, as I already said, the core radius now is been replaced by two. Uh, twice the width divided by uh, uh, the Euler number. And that also uh, removes the singularity um, when RC goes to uh, zero. So we have a more physical model of the dislocation. And we have a physical picture of the balance of forces in the dislocation core. Yes, and as I just said, choosing RC uh, like shown here, uh, makes the energy become identical to the linear elastic expression. That is also why sometimes um, this choice is made so that you can get also with a linear elastic expression uh, the same energy as you would obtain with the bias Navarro model. Yes, that that was the in essence the the derivation for the bias Navarro model. Uh, now I want to show you how the bias potential um, comes into the game. Uh, for that, we have to do something uh, different when we calculate the misfit energy. Uh, here is the reminder. The energy was the addition of the misfit part and the linear elastic part. Previously, we have integrated gamma of x from minus infinity to plus infinity. And now, one can say, yes, but wait, um, if I think about bonds, I only 
have here a bond, and then the next one is uh, at a distance, at a given distance. And so wouldn't it make sense in a real crystal to make a summation over the bonds or the positions where I have a bond rather than integrating continuously because in the end, we have atoms and the atoms are not continuous entities. And I have specific places where I have an atom and there I can say here, locally, the energy has the value of gamma. And um, I have then to sum all these contributions up. So that's shown here. Rather than integrating, then one sums uh, discreetly all the points uh, where I have a bond, right? So that will be in this example here, this point of gamma, this point of gamma, the maximum, and again, here and here. And the point now is, if I now shift the center of the dislocation by a certain amount t, you can see that now the points that I would take when I make this summation would be different points. This one, this one, the maximum would not appear even, then I would have this point here and the next point would be here. And you can imagine now that this summation will not give the same as the integral. I have now, you can see that almost like an error of integration if I have a two coarse grid, right? But this is really physical because in the end, the coarseness of the grid is given by the crystal lattice. And so if the width, if is small in compared to the distance of the atoms, then I run into such a situation that I don't really have an integral, but I have a discrete summation. And in that um, case, the energy now, the misfit energy is not anymore what we had before, gb squared divided by four pi one minus the Poisson ratio, but it's this expression plus a correction and um, the correction itself has this dependency. So it's a cosine function with the displacement t. So if I displace t, if I displace this location, I will see a periodic variation of this expression here. And the amplitude of this variation will go with uh, the uh, exponential function. If the width is very large, then the amplitude will be very small. And this can be also understood here. If you think if you have a very wide gamma, then a discrete summation will give always the same result because essentially we are integrating the same function twice, right? But if my gamma is very narrow, so if my width is very narrow, then the discretization will grow more and more and the amplitude of the cosine will be larger. And uh, so this leads us to a very important uh, consequence that the periodic variation of the energy with the displacement of the dislocation is a periodic function and the amplitude goes with the exponent where the, um, the ratio of the width over the Burgess vector goes in. Um, that is very important because the pile stress, which is now the stress that I need to apply to displace this dislocation, can be, can be obtained from uh, the function that we have seen before, the pile's uh, potential, by taking the derivative and looking where the um, stress is maximal. And that gives us, if we take the derivative of the cosine, it is one and we are left just with uh, the amplitude and the amplitude was this expression before. And very importantly, we get the result that the pile stress goes exponentially with the width. So very wide dislocation will have a very small pile barrier. And that is the case that can tell you for FCC metals in general. If I have a narrow core, and that is more the case for BCC crystals, the bias stress is higher. And um, that follows already from this quite simple picture of the bias Navarro model. Um, we will see in the next lecture then in a more elaborate way, how this can also be understood. But for the moment, I would just like to show you if you take cubic isotropic crystals, 
and you assume certain values for the Poisson ratio, then you see that the bias stress becomes, if I relate it to the shear modulus, it's about a percent of the, of the shear modulus. This follows from the bias Navarro model, from this expression here. And it depends on the width, which in turn depends on the um, Poisson ratio. I just re maybe go back very shortly just to tell you once more. Sorry for jumping. Yeah, we saw that the width is a function of the Poisson ratio. So if I change the Poisson ratio, I also change the width, and accordingly, the bias barrier changes. If we look at the theoretical strength that we have seen in the first lecture, where I make a rigid displacement, we got the result that the theoretical strength was g divided by 6, which is 0.16. So you see here how much lower the stress is to displace a dislocation with respect to the stress that they need to displace the whole layer at once rigidly. So what we have seen in more qualitative uh, in a more qualitative picture in the first lecture is now really um, captured by a model which really quantifies the change. Yes, so I think this is the most important um, message from the bias stress uh, from the bias Navarro model that the bias stress uh, goes down with the width, goes down exponentially. Uh, and also, um, it is a method to get rid of singularities in the dislocation core and historically the first model which has given um, yeah, a nonlinear uh, description of the dislocation as it should be because a crystal is always nonlinear once displacements get large. Just a few uh, further remarks on the bias Navarro model. Uh, we have seen here a one-dimensional derivation, which is based on the balance of stress. Uh, in this form, it can be carried out for an edge or a screw dislocation. We have seen the edge dislocation derivation. Uh, in real crystals, the displacement has, in general, two components, not just edge, but also screw, and it can change. We will see that more in the next lectures. So real crystals do not, um, first of all, you can have a mixed dislocation, but you can also have locally a uh, different character. And um, one problem that uh, of this model is that it cannot really take into account uh, the change in dislocation width as the dislocation moves. For that reason, there have been generalizations uh, treated and proposed for the Pius Navarro model where u of x is a vector really, which has two components as shown here. So the vector would be the addition of two parts, one going along x direction as we've seen before, and then also normal to it um, uh, would be a second component. And the um, solution uh, is done not um, done with this uh, equilibration of stresses anymore, but is done by minimization of the energy, which is an alternative approach to get the same result. Uh, in that case, the expressions look a little bit more complicated. I just show you here that it's again the same principle that you have a misfit term shown here, uh, plus a linear elastic term. Here we have the Stroh tensor. If you are uh, in anisotropic linear elasticity, it is more complicated. If you are interested, I can highly recommend the paper that I have highlighted before, uh, which contains um, all the details and is very much understand. It's written in a good way so that you can really understand it in my eyes. Yes, but this ends my part on the Piers Navarro model. And let me now go to the next topic, which is um, related to description of interatomic bonding. Because if you have a very good of interatomic bonding, we can just calculate directly these locations and we don't have to care about linear elasticity or um, bias Navarro model because we can just construct our block, uh, put the atoms where, they where, where we think they, sh they should be, starting with a reasonable assumption, you create the dislocation initially, and then you just let the dislocation relax and you get the energy, you get the displacements, and out directly without 
any further modeling in principle. Uh, nevertheless, the linear elastic expression is very important to understand your result. And also the Pius Navarro model is extremely helpful to understand what kind of result you get from such calculations. But now I want to show you a little bit of what the possibilities are to describe interatomic bonding. So what we want to do now is we have a bunch of atoms that we set up somehow in my supercell. And I want to relax the structure and to find the energetic minimum of this um, uh, collection of atoms. And what possibilities do I have for that? Here I show the hierarchy of atomistic methods that are available. Uh, I start with the smallest accuracy um, methods, which are the empirical methods, for example, Leonard Jones potentials. I will show you two examples of empirical methods in the following. Such uh, calculations are quite cheap and one can treat up to 10 to the nine atoms. This is already advanced, so you have to use supercomputers for doing that. But you can also, on a normal workstation, easily get uh, and treat atoms to, I don't know, uh, 10 to the 6 atoms. Um, the next type of uh, potential, which I use a lot, um, are semi empirical methods where, for example, the embedded atom method, which I'm also going to show you a little bit more about. And then there are um, methods which already include to some degree electronic structure, which are bound order potentials or type binding methods. Uh, these two are used quite a lot for this location modeling. This method, not so much. This is more for quantum chemistry. And, um, and then, we can go and get even more precise. And then we are, um, we have here density functional theory, uh, which is an ab initio theory, which means that here in this block, we do not have any parameters in the theory which are material dependent, which is the specific thing of empirical methods or semi empirical methods. That here I have parameters which are adopted to the material. In ab initio calculation, you don't have that. Density functional theory in, in general does not contain any materials dependent parameters. And uh, density functional theory is being extended, uh, it's an active research field to get beyond density functional theory, uh, to be able to get even more precise and to get rid of approximations, which are also in density functional theory uh, included in the exchange correlation function. Yeah, so we will see what kind of methods we will have maybe in 10 or 20 years, as far as that is concerned. For this location modeling, DFT is the gold standard, right? There's nothing more precise than DFT. And um, embedded atom methods are always being checked with respect to DFT, whether they give the same result. Although, in general, DFT per se is also not perfect and also has some approximations and we know that a different functional can give you different results. Yeah, but in terms of the transferability and accuracy, density function theory is much more precise than the methods shown here. Let me shortly give you an idea about these methods so you can understand them a little bit better. Empirical methods are, for example, Leonard Jones potentials or the Morse potential. And uh, the general idea is if I have such a dislocation uh, structure and I start it in this way, what I do is that I can calculate total energy just by adding all the um, uh, local contributions up. Essentially, I add all pairs, all bonds, which are here shown by the straight lines. And I look at the distance and then I get the total energy of my system. And um, by taking the derivative of the total energy with respect to the distance, I can um, calculate forces and I can relax my structure. Yeah, the essential ingredient is um, this expression for uh, the interatomic um, interaction. It contains, in the case of Leonard Jones, potential two parameters, A and B, which are material specific. So if I want to describe a certain material, I will adopt let's say, I don't know, silicon, I will change A and B so that I get the best description 
of silicon. If I want to describe aluminum, I will change A and B, so I get a good description for aluminum. Usually one looks at the elastic constants that they write, because you want to have a good description, first of all, far away from the dislocation core. And then one maybe goes and tries to uh, parameterize also vacancies and, and so forth. Very rarely, functions are parameterized to the dislocation itself. And that is the reason why also in many occasions, semi-empirical or empirical methods do not work very well for uh, certain dislocation related properties. Anyway, so these simple uh, potentials as we see them here, you can see how they look like, they are quite similar. You can see here is Leonard Jones, here is Morse. Yeah, almost indistinguishable, although the expression is quite different. <clears throat> These methods are quite useful if you consider Van der Waals bonded systems. For example, a Van der Waals bond bound system would be an argon crystal, <laughs> which is <clears throat> only really stable at very low temperatures. Um, yeah, for example. Um, in that case, they look, uh, they work very well. If you have covalent bonding, uh, they don't work so well anymore. And that's also the reason why um, these methods are not commonly used for these location simulations, because we are usually interested in metals in uh, metallic alloys where we have covalent bonding as well. And in that case, you cannot use uh, these expressions so well. The workhorse is embedded atom method, um, EAM that has been developed in 1985 and has been also uh, developed further than later. So there is also modified embedded atom method, second nearest neighbor um, embedded atom method and so forth. So there are variations of this metal, uh, of this um, method available. Um, the essential equations are written here. So now the total energy is not the sum over all pairs that we had before. So here we had, we were summing over all pairs, basically over all bonds here, right? <clears throat> now we add over every atom, where the energy of every atom is calculated as a sum of two terms, the pair term here, which is similar to what we had before, and an embedding term, which arises from the idea that if you embed an atom in a certain sea of electrons with a certain electron density, the energy will depend on that. And this is taken into account with the embedding term. And uh, the electron density again is obtained, is dependent on the distance of the um, atoms and is obtained in this way. So F, small f, this phi here, and also uh, this capital F are functions which need to be adopted to the material, but uh, with these functions, uh, one can fit much better to uh, metals and metallic alloys. Um, and so the embedded atom method was very successfully used for these location simulations um, over many years. I will just shortly uh, say a, a few words about the advantages and disadvantages of EAM simulations. Uh, a uh, big advantage is that you can really run large simulation uh, cells. Just checking the time here. So you can treat up to yeah, 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 even atoms, which is uh, just incredible. Uh, if you come from the world of DFT, where you usually just can treat like 1,000 atoms. And so with EAM, what you can do is really to set up a, a small portion of microstructure with grains, grain boundary, dislocations inside. You can load a microstructural element and look how these locations are being nucleated, how they interact with each other and all these things. So really uh, a large simulation. And you can also really study the motion of this location as a function of temperature because you can afford doing uh, molecular dynamics runs over long time scales. The disadvantage of EAM is that there are a lot of parameterizations for the same element and you don't know a priori what to use. So you usually test them to see whether they fit your purposes, whether they do what you want them to do. But in general, it's not entirely clear what kind of uh, parameterization is better than the other one. 
you have in general limited transferability and most importantly you it's not really clear whether what you observe a specific nucleation for example of a dislocation or interaction of uh, dislocation whether that really occurs in the material that you are targeting you take aem for aluminum and you get a behavior that might not occur in aluminum because the description of interatomic bonding is not as is not so elaborate that you can be sure that what you are um, uh, obtaining is really the material behavior of aluminum <clears throat> that is um, the problem which has been uh, named garbage in garbage out problem if you have a bad potential, you will also get a bad result, right, in the end. <clears throat> Nevertheless, EM simulations are very helpful because they show you what kind of processes can occur at all in materials, right? You're not so sure, maybe it's not uh, really happening in that material, but maybe there's another material where this parameterization is correct, and then it would actually be a reality. The, this kind of process can be really expected. Um, that is the big advantage, and there have been many important discoveries done also with EAM with respect to uh, these location simulations. As a last point for today, I still have five minutes. I would like to then uh, explain a little bit more about density functional theory. Density functional theory is not different to EAM because it is ab initio, it does not contain any materials dependent uh, parameters. Density functional theory has been developed by Walter Kohn, uh, who grew up in Vienna, but had to leave uh, then Austria because of the Second uh, World War and uh, Nazi regime. He was Jewish, and so he had to, to uh, yeah, save his life, basically, where at the age of like 15 or so. <clears throat> and he ended up in America, where then he laid the cornerstones from the, for DFD, and got the Nobel Prize for his developments in 1998. Uh, the theory is still under active development. There are still people who are working on exchange correlation uh, functionals and development of exchange correlation functional. Uh, so it is an active uh, theory in the sense that uh, it's not closed. Uh, we have a parameter-free quantum mechanical description of interatomic bonding, and that is also the reason why it's so transferable. Typically, you can run up to 1,000 atoms, but you can also go a little bit larger depending on the exact program you're using and the wave functions that have been, or that the wave function that are used in the, in the code. Uh, but you generally always use a supercomputer uh, to do DFT calculations, especially when you run DFT simulations of these locations. Here just uh, one slide on how it works. And the heart of DFT is the Koncham equation, which is a Schrödinger type of equation where we solve for electron wave functions. Uh, no, uh, yes. I have a little note on the on the last slide. Yes. Please go back once yeah. again. I think the 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 uh, date of Walter Kohn's. Uh, the 1916. He lived from 1923 to 1916. So I think that's a ah 2016. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I just it's very. Uh, thank you very much. Just a little <laughs> so note. Course, yeah, it's of course wrong. I just yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for making me aware. Of, of course, yeah. of course. It's of course 2016. So he died just He's a, two years ago. Yeah. He's a time traveler. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> thank you very much to BS for. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. Okay, so we were here at the Koncham equation. Um, we see here, I just want to schematically show you, in DFT, you imagine that you have an electron C of all valence electrons. You have the core of the atoms uh, where the electrons are not interacting. So these are just the core electrons are basically always bound to the atom and do not do anything in bonding. So only the valence electrons are the ones who really um, participate in bonding and really create um, or are relevant for uh, crystals. And um, basically one solves for all the wave functions of the electrons. The trick in DFT is that one considers these electrons to be independent. So this electron 
moves as if these two ele other electrons were not there. And then the solution of the equation is much simpler because you have just to essentially solve the Koncham equation and not the many body Schrodinger equation. The, um, the disadvantage is that you have now an effective potential which depends on the electron density. So somehow one has to still care about the other electrons and it's done in a way that you construct an effect, an effective potential, which depends again on the density of the electrons, but not on their wave functions. Uh, <clears throat> so the effective potential, which is the potential within every electron moves in independently, is a sum of the external potential, which comes from the nuclei of the atoms, and then of the Hartree potential, which is the classical electrostatic interaction, and then the exchange correlation uh, potential, which is where all the approximations of D are in the end stored. And um, to find the right exchange correlation potential is uh, the task of many scientists working on exchange correlation development. Uh, I show you here the most important scientist in this respect. It is also he is also the most cited physicist uh, in the world. <laughs> so um, uh, he has done a lot of developments um, for density function theory, and since density function theory is used so intensively, everyone cites him and his development, and this has made him the most cited uh, physicist worldwide. He has also introduced this Jacobs ladder to the heaven of chemical accuracy. Um, here we see different exchange correlation uh, functions uh, on the ladder. Local density approximation is the so in in, uh, in the uh, basically before even going up to heaven, we are in um, uh, in hell, right? <laughs> so this is hell. That's the harder world where we don't have any exchange correlation effect, where we just have the Hartree expression, right? That is a very bad description of interatomic bonding, but of course, the, um, historically, this was um, the, um, the, the first type of proposition then, but then uh, Walter Kohn made his um, uh, suggestion and came up with the local density approximation which is at this level of approximation. Then Purdue and co-workers have worked a lot on uh, generalized gradient approximation potentials, exchange correlation potentials, GGAs, which improve in certain respects, but not in all respects over LDA. Then there are meta GGAs, where one takes in addition um, the local density, but also the derivative, uh, 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 sorry, for GGA, one also takes the derivative of the density as an input. Uh, for the meta GGA, one also takes the kinetic energy of the electrons, and then one goes up and can introduce more and more information in the exchange correlation functional. Here on this level, which is called hyper GGA, one takes also the unoccupied orbitals then uh, into account. And so one moves up the, the, the ladder and gets more and more precise. It would be nice if we were able to use such methods for these location simulations as well. It's not currently possible. Uh, RPA would in general be possible, but um, in the end you don't really, in the current implementations, you don't gain a lot. And also it's very difficult to run simulations. So in the end, DFT simulations are always carried out on this level, on the GGA level at the moment. But I foresee that maybe in 10 years or so, or in five years, such methods will become more and more available. And then we will see uh, how those results will change what we know at the moment uh, on these locations uh, as obtained from DFT simulations. Just, uh, this is my last slide. <clears throat> A few words on the pros and cons of DFT. I already said that it's a very precise method and highly transferable method because it really solves the many body problem. So bonding uh, is always described newly. If I assemble my atoms differently, I calculate a new bond 
and they get uh, the results. So it's a very transferable method. It can cope with different crystal structures and also different uh, atomic species. <clears throat> you can take him basically the, the, the whole uh, periodic table and work with it. The disadvantage is that you have a reduced, uh, a very reduced system size. Uh, you have still the uncertainty in the exchange correlation potentials uh, and uh, you have calculations which are techni technically quite demanding. So you need to do careful uh, convergence studies with respect to K points and other cutoffs, for example. And you also need to, to make a good choice for your pseudopotentials. That makes DFT simulations more advanced compared to EM simulations. And that also restricts DFT simulations to specific investigations on these locations. Yeah, but I will show you more in the next lecture on that. And for the moment, uh, I'm done for today. If you have still questions, you can just ask them now. Seems not to be the case. So um, then we are done for today and I see you next week. Bye.